Okay, our next speaker in, the, in this panel is Marina Lostal, who is a senior lecturer at the School of Law at the University of Essex, where she's also the deputy director of its Human Rights Clinic Center. Marina is admitted to practice in Spain, holds a PhD from the beautiful European University Institute, <laughs> and an LLM from the University of Cambridge, equally beautiful, of course. She specializes in the rights of victims in, an, in international criminal law, the protection of cultural heritage in armed conflict, and animal law. Between 2017 and 2020, she worked as a reparations expert at the International Criminal Court, first advising the trial chamber eight in the Al Mahdi case, and then assisting the trust fund for victims in various ICC cases at the reparations stage. Marina, I very much look forward to your talk. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, before starting with the presentation, just a small disclaimer um, that um, even though I have been involved in the work of the International Criminal Court, this in a way represents the views of the court. I wish it would, but not at all. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you again, Rafael and Son, for the invitation, for the uh, conference presentations, for the food and the company. Um, so I'm presenting something that I've actually been working on for the last one and a half, two years, and that was published uh, less than a month ago at the Journal of International Criminal Justice. That is a mainstream uh, journal of international criminal law, very much read by both practitioners and academics. And somehow I managed to sneak in the very outlandish question, <laughs> could animals qualify as victims before the International Criminal Court? And I knew well before studying this research that the answer to the question is a resounding no. No way they can qualify as victims before the International Criminal Court. But the purpose of the paper was not the conclusion, but the analysis that I had to go through to reach the conclusion. Because the purpose of the analysis is to show that the only reason why animals cannot qualify as victims before the International Criminal Court is because they're not human beings. Yet, they comfortably qualify and meet, meet the other two qualifying criteria for victimhood before the International Criminal Court, namely, suffer harm, and secondly, as a result of the commission of crimes within the jurisdiction of the court. The International Criminal Court is one of the international tribunals based in The Hague that is concerned with the individual criminal responsibility of those who have committed uh, one of those uh, four international crimes under the material jurisdiction of the court, namely war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and the crime of aggression. And I found this discovery that it was only because they were not human beings that they could not qualify as victims problematic, not because I'm advocating for them to become victims at the ICC. I don't think it's the right place to, to fight this battle, and not the right time uh, either. I was I found it problematic because animals are just non-existent in the legal framework of the ICC in any manner whatsoever. The Rome Statute, the uh, Rules of Procedure and Evidence, the Rome legal system that bases the International Criminal Court does not contain any provision whatsoever concerning animals as such. And to date, they have been treated as mere objects following the entrenched binary division that derives the legal world into persons and things where only the former are entitled to rights um, and other entitlements. And this silence of the legal framework, I think, is a bit weird because it stands in a stark contrast with the frequency with which the International Criminal Court has to deal with animals. They sometimes appear in criminal proceedings, for example, when uh, animals have been object of pillage, but without a doubt and without exception, animals have been voluntarily brought forward in every single reparations proceedings before the court. So just in a nutshell, to explain to you what reparations proceedings are, at the ICC, when the conviction has been entered against uh, an accused person, the reparations proceedings begin. Reparations are not criminal in nature, and they only have the purpose that of remedying the harm that has been caused to victims. And the reparations measures that have been put forward in every single reparations case at the court 
has involved the use of animals, even though most of the times the criminal conduct for which the person was convicted had nothing to do with animals. And the reason why animals appear so frequently in reparations proceedings is because most of the situations that the ICC deals with are located in West Africa or the Sahel region, where animals play a very important part in daily life. Um, and reparation measures need to carry a real meaningful reparative value to victims, so you have to provide to them something that is meaningful to their lives, not just a sum of money. Um, and this was aptly expressed by the legal representative of victims in one of the cases that was located in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He said, cattle plays an important role in the family and societal relations of victims. Owning animals represents a form of social status. Or as a friend of mine, a, co a former colleague of mine was told by a victim, you have a credit card, I have cows. Animals have featured most prominently in the Katanga case. Um, Germain Katanga was the commander of an armed non-state actor fighting in the Democratic Republic of <coughs> Congo and um, he, was, um, he was behind an attack against a town in um, DRC in 2003 where the target was actually the Hema ethnic group. Um, he was found guilty as an accessory of murder as a war crime, murder as a crime against humanity, destruction of property and also pillage. He was sentenced to 12 years of imprisonment and made liable for $1 million in reparations to redress the harm of victims. The activities proposed to carry out with this budget of $1 million included vocational training in animal husbandry, provision of a small livestock, and since cows are a totemic figure in the Hema culture that were the target of the attack, it was also proposed by the lawyer of victims that those individuals who had suffered the loss of a close, rel close relative, such as a parent, should receive, and I quote, one cow with four teeth and a corresponding veterinary kit. End of quote. This is the most remarkable case that uh, brought animals to it, but it's not by far the only one. And my contention is the fact that animals have entered and stayed in the realm of international criminal justice who are objects and without qualification is problematic. And it's problematic because of the animal front movement that has already permeated the international and domestic legal spheres, both of which are legally relevant to the legal framework of the ICC by virtue of Article 21 that lists the legal sources of the ICC. The ICC applies its own statute, its own norms, etc. But failing that, it has to apply the rules and principles of international law. And failing that, they have to apply the rules and principles derived by the court from national laws of legal systems of the world. Now, and we have been seeing today and yesterday, that there is now an increasing mass of international and domestic rules that no longer consider animals as objects and give them and afford them some degree of a special protection. Um, Malgorzata has mentioned different civil codes, but we also know cases such as the uh, WTO uh, panel in 2014 and the seal van products case that famously said animal welfare is a globally recognized issue. The Treaty of the Function of the European Union acknowledges animal sentience. Courts in Argentina and in Pakistan have afforded legal rights to respectively a chimpanzee and an elephant. South Africa was mentioned yesterday um, as labeling animals as individuals and so forth. Now, the number of examples that we have with this legal turn is still limited, but it's not anecdotal or isolated anymore. Um, and so I find this systemic silence of the IC legal framework problematic and increasingly awkward and inadequate, given though also the ICC sits at the apex of justice at the international level. So I don't claim at all in the article that animals should qualify as victims, but I try to also make the case that they're not objects either. And of course, it's very objectionable to many to treat them as human beings, but I think it's even more objectionable to treat them as tables. And to instill this um, change or paradigm shift, I ask the outlandish question of could animals qualify as victims? And so I'm going to now walk you through the analysis that I 
um, carried out. Okay, so first of all, the definition of victims is in Rule 85 of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence of the ICC. And here you'll see that there are two categories. Category A refers to natural persons, and category B refers to what we commonly would understand as legal persons. I did not go down the way of trying to see whether the legal persons, because I was not interested in that venue, in that avenue, and also because I found um, preliminary dead end. If you see the qualifications to um, constitute a, legal, a victim legal person, you need to have sustained direct harm to any of your property. And given that animals don't seem to have a right to own, or it would be very complicated to argue, I went uh, to analyze only whether animals could qualify as victims pursuant to Rule 85A that says, as you see, that there are three requirements to fulfill. Being natural persons, to have suffered harm, and thirdly, as a result of the commission of crimes within the jurisdiction of the court, again, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide and aggression. So this is the uh, structure of the argument and everything I, I looked into the article. Um, I'm not going to um, go through everything. I'm just going to um, illustrate to you three points. The first one that is the most controversial, um, can animals qualify as natural persons? Secondly, um, can animals suffer harm? And I'm going to make the case that they can suffer harm in many ways, including moral harm. And um, whether they can do it as a result of the commission of crimes within the jurisdiction of the court, that also happens because in most cases they are harmed um, uh, by the commission of crimes. Um, just a side note, the definition of of uh, victims in Rule 85A, that of natural persons, encompasses the concept of both direct and indirect victims. So you can be a natural person who is a direct victim because that has directly happened to you, or you can be an indirect victim because it has some happened to someone that matters to you, to your son, to your husband, or someone with who you can uh, prove a close relationship. Okay, so. The, um, the first criterion is the one that is bound to um, find more resistance. But it necessitates, <laughs> um, given an answer to what is a natural person. The natural criterion within this uh, element doesn't seem too problematic. Like, natural is something as opposed to artificial. So we might um, agree, and I think it's quite uncontroversial, that animals are natural. Um, as opposed to an institution or a robot, right? Personhood, however, is a different story. Many think that the concept of uh, personhood refers to the biological condition of being a human being. However, personhood is used to explain why one entity, the person, has an enhanced moral status um, over non-persons. And so the central question is, what is it in us, what is it in human beings, because we are understand, as understood as persons, that justifies our higher moral status and thus our entitlement to all these rights, to the exclusion of other things' rights or other persons, non-persons' rights? And this is where things get a bit messy, because I'm trying to find a theory that would explain what is so unique in us that we are entitled to personhood to the detriment of others. And I found different theories with which many of you will be familiar. I've picked two uh, for the presentation. One is the theory of human exceptionalism that basically says that we have such unique capabilities that of course we are different to other things such as animals. And this is the theory espoused, for example, by the German Ethics Council that regards humans' capacity for language and culture, self-awareness and capacity for moral reasoning and moral behavior as the basis of our special position. The slight problem with this theory is that it has been constantly disproven by science. The use of language, ethical engagement, the capacity to solve social problems, express emotions, and even have a freaking sense of humor has been observed in several animal species. Human exceptionalism has reacted to this puzzling um, discoveries by raising the bar of personhood. But that is short-sighted because then you end up excluding human beings from the bar of personhood and you leave outside infants, uh, those that are mentally impaired or in a comatose state. 
So that would seem uh, unacceptable. Then we also have, of course, the social contract theory of personhood, uh, which is a quid, quid pro quo. Um, a person is any being, object, association, anything at all, that the law endows with the capacity of acquiring rights and incurring duties. And this is the um, theory espoused by the International Law Commission and also by one judge at the um, New York Supreme Court that denied personhood to Tommy, who is one of the chimpanzees that Stephen Weiss is fighting for that has been encaged in a horrible enclosure for the past 15 years. Um, but again, this theory then does not explain to me why infants, why mentally impaired people and those in a vegetative state that are incapable of holding duties are considered persons. So I think that this all goes to show that the notion of personhood is fraught with ambiguities, with unclarity, and lots of tensions that are likely to become more, um, more so with the development of artificial intelligence and, of course, with the animal turn movement. Um, and then, it, then I thought, well, the definition of personhood is whatever you want it to be and it's a matter of choice. And then I looked into what has been the choice of the ICC. How do they regard personhood? And here I found one of my most favourite passages in jurisprudence of all times. The ICC in its early jurisprudence had to grapple with its basic legal concepts. And in 2006, a pretrial chamber had to explain what a natural person was. And this is what it said. The ordinary meaning of the term natural person, as it appears in Rule 85A, is, in English, a human being. But then, footnote 68 doesn't really support what this passage is saying. The authority cited in footnote 68 does not say this at all. It refers back to Black's Law Dictionary definition of person that says that so far as legally, legal theory is concerned, a person is any being whom the law regards as capable of rights and duties. Any being that is capable is a person, whether a human being or not. Of course, this definition has its own problems, but the final part, I think, is explicitly revealing whether a human being or not. The fact is, however, that this interpretation of a person at the ICC has remained unchallenged. And um, as a matter of doctrine, as a matter of uh, lex lata, animals cannot qualify um, under this sub-criterion because they're not human beings. But I thought, just for fun, let's go into the other two criteria. Can animals suffer harm? Um, the ICC is quite progressive with the understanding of harm, and they have um, categorized so far four types of harm, physical, moral, material, and also the deprivation of rights as a subset of, um, of harm. And I find this quite um, remarkable, and I'll explain why. I think one of the most important aspects that distinguishes the ICC system for reparations from the system of reparations of human rights courts is that you don't need to have a pre-existing right to be harmed. The notion of victimhood, victimhood revolves around the notion of harm. So you don't need to have a human right or a right of any sort to be considered a victim so long as you can prove that you had suffered harm as a result of, uh, of a crime and of course you're a human being. But you don't need a pre-entitlement, if that makes sense. Anyway, so I think for the audience today, um, it would be self-evident that animals can suffer physical uh, harm. In the paper, I also go with um, material. I also try to figure out if they can suffer material harm, and I think they can. Deriving from the deprivation of rights, not really because they're not, mm, they don't have rights yet, but moral. Can animals suffer moral harm? And uh, I concluded they can. Um, suffering moral harm refers to mental or emotional distress, including emotions such as anxiety and fear. And the uh, usual causes of suffering harm are manifold, but um, most of the time they derive from being subject to aggressive behavior, witnessing aggressive behavior, or losing loved ones, uh, most prominently, obviously, family members. Um, and then I did research in zoology. I, I, I don't know exactly. I read lots of papers that I, that I try to understand. In one, of, one field of research, that was very illuminated in this respect was thanatology. Thanatology is the field of research that studies the behavior of um, uh, animals uh, to the depth of their conspecifics. 
So thanatology has shown that several species, rats, primates, elephants, giraffes, and cetaceans, understand the death of their conspecifics and react at the very minimum by burying the corpse. But they have also showed more complex behavior, such as staying near the deceased animal for extended periods of time. They also repeatedly um, visit the place where the animal died, or to the contrary, they just avoid it altogether, depending, of course, on the personality of the animal, which, by the way, they possess. Um, grief has been observed in geese, lion mothers, dolphins, orphan gorillas, um, and also chimpanzees. And Jane Goodall um, also um, um, explained how some chimpanzees would even let themselves die out of grief. So research continues to accumulate, and in the words of um, um, uh, Mark Bekoff, by now there is compelling evidence that at least some animals are likely to feel a full range of emotions, including fear, joy, happiness, shame, embarrassment, resentment, jealousy, rage, anger, love, pleasure, compassion, respect, relief, disgust, sadness, despair, and grief. And at least the three types of emotions, when established to the requisite um, standard of proof, are recognized forms of moral harm at the ICC. Now, the third criterion, can animals suffer harm as a result of the commission of crimes within the jurisdiction of the court? And I found many, many examples of how they can suffer harm, but one particular crime I found quite um, illustrative. And that is the crime of a starvation. And the reason why I find it illustrative is because it can, um, um, it can constitute three different uh, international crimes, depending on the contextual elements. It can be a war crime. Uh, it can be a crime against humanity of, for example, persecution or other inhumane acts. And it can be a modus operandi of committing genocide. So a starvation fits the bill for several crimes. Um, how do animals become harmed by this practice? In many different ways. Um, one uh, very direct modus operandi of committing a starvation against the civilian population, that is, uh, depriving them of, of, of food, is by killing their livestock, above all in rural rural societies. So if um, someone follows a scorch earth operation um, that uh, entails killing uh, livestock, then that livestock will be harmed in the process of doing so. This, um, as a result of the starvation, can also um, be the consequence of the fact that there is no food for anyone, anyone at all. There is no food for human beings, there is not going to be food for animals. And this is what happened in Yemen uh, around five years ago in what is arguably a wider context of a starvation, where um, there were reports back then of uh, the um, animal, uh, animals in the zoo starving to death because there was no food or no management also to give them food, even if there was one. Um, the, the fate of these animals is unknown to me, and uh, these news are from uh, 2016, I believe. They can also die because animals that were traditionally not a source of food become a source of food out of necessity. There are tales in the Spanish Civil War how all of a sudden um, you were not eating rabbit, but probably the neighbor's cat. Um, but a very much more recent example happened in the Syrian Civil War, where out of necessity, any man <coughs> issued a fatwa, that is a religious decree, saying to the population, it is now OK for you to eat dogs, cats, and donkeys, something that otherwise would be prohibited, prohibited and would consider haram in the Islamic religion. So there are, these are three illustrative ways in which animals can be harmed um, in the context of international crimes. So to conclude, what would it mean in this parallel world where animals would be admitted as victims at the ICC? What would be the relevance of it? it will be of tremendous relevance because they will have a lot of procedural rights. First of all, they have the procedural right to participate in proceedings. And this is not a cosmetic presence in the courtroom. Um, the legal representative of victims that speak on behalf of victims, and in this case would speak on behalf of animals, um, are entitled to do opening statements, closing statements, question witnesses, tender evidence, and also um, have access to the confidential filings and to the case record as such. So participating in proceedings has a, is a very powerful tool to contribute to the narrative of the case and tell the story of harm that otherwise would not be known. And this is a unique feature of the ICC that didn't happen in other international tribunals before. Once a conviction has been, in, has been entered, then there is an entitlement to reparations pursuant to Article 75 
that is to mm, have your harm redressed through individual or collective reparations, and there are many ways in, this, uh, in, in which this can be achieved. Um, this question of like, let's think about the animal uh, question in the ICC has also a more realistic, short-term practical application. When a person is apprehended by the International Criminal Court because he has an arrest warrant, one of the first things that the ICC is obliged to do is to freeze his assets. And in case of conviction, these assets are then turned into money to pay the, the defense and also victims. Now, so far the ICC has dealt with um, uh, accused that were either broke or had a lot of money, but had a lot of money in more traditional ways, like cash um, and planes. But there are some people that have arrest warrants in the ICC that have animals and animals derivatives. Joseph Kony is the leader of the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, and this uh, rebel group is very famous for engaging in poaching. So it would not be out of uh, the imagination to find him maybe with rhino horns and elephant tusks. And what do you do with those? Do you sell them to the Asian medicine market to make money because they're for victims? Or don't you? And why? Is there a protocol? And this question has not been dealt with before or, or thought about at registry. Then the other case is that of Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, the son of Gaddafi, that also has an arrest warrant since 2012, I believe, um, concerning the situation in Libya. And uh, the peculiarity of uh, this individual is that um, he had a private zoo with uh, lions, with camels, with ostriches, ostriches, with very rare species. Now, there's two different scenarios. They might have all died, or they might have all reproduced. So if he was ever apprehended, by the, um, by the ICC, maybe we're dealing with no animals, but with hundreds of them. And what do you do? Because they are objects, right? So, um, as, as the ICC regards them. So, do you, do you sell them? What do you do with the elephant um, in the courtroom? Mm -hmm. So, um, the purpose I had with this paper is to just send a key message to those that read international criminal law. Animals, yes, so they're not humans, but they're not objects either. Um, and it is, again, as objectionable to call them a human being as it is, as it is to call them um, a table. Thank you very much.